Brother, Brother Zach Knight, now he'll tell you more about his testimony, I'm sure, preaching, but he's going to close us out. But he went to, of all places, Auburn University. <laughs> Auburn, Auburn University. <laughs> Auburn University. And uh, when he got out, he was so anti-church, anti-Christian. That he went. My my understanding is he he was actually going to prove that what preachers saying what the what was was untrue. He's untrue until he got in the Bible, and he ended up at uh, here with us at Faith Bible College, and he graduated with very high honors. And we're he is he's, he's uh, of course brother. Uh, he had some great professors too. We've got some great professors here. Uh, so, Brother Zach Knight, you come and preach to us. And thank you for being here. Amen. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't plan on talking about any of that. Uh, <laughs> but I guess now I got to. Um, so, there we go. There we go. Say it again for Brother Joe over there. Uh, uh, open your Bibles with me. Open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 3. And uh, as we're turning, uh, yeah, that's. Um, uh, I thought I was smart. I thought I was really smart, Brother Rowan. I thought I was smarter than all these, these gullible Christians uh, believing this old fairy tale book. And. Uh, I was fine with you doing what you were doing over there, but but when you when you when you brought it, when you got in my face with it, I was like, oh, oh, okay, let's uh, <clears throat> let me let me straighten you out. And uh, anyway, I, I realized <clears throat> again, wasn't planning on talking about this, so bear with me. Um, I, I, Brother Joe was the pastor of the church. Uh, my mom was going to church there. I started going, and, and Brother Steve was the adult Sunday school teacher, and. Um, I met with uh, Brother Joe, um, met with uh, another guy from the church, Mike Cody, good friend of ours, he's still there. And, um, and here's what I wanted to do. Uh, let, let me, I'll just tell you what I want. I, I wanted to say something. You see, I thought I, was, uh, I, thought I had this information. I thought I had this, this uh, knowledge that once they were aware of it, I, I was going to um, just, just stop them in their tracks. I, I was looking for this. I was waiting for that look. I was waiting for that look where they were like, oh, wow. Uh, I'm so glad I met this guy. You know what? It never happened. I couldn't shake him. I couldn't shake him. And at the time, I thought it was uh, uh, ridiculous. I was like, these people. Well, uh, anyway, talking one night with, uh, and I'm wasting all my time. I only, I only got a few minutes. I'm, I'm, it, Thanks, Brother Rowan. Thank you for that. Um, um, I, I talked with a, a friend of ours, Mike Cody, one time. We were talking, and, and he's giving me scripture, and he's trying to tell me about Christ. He's trying to tell me about the Lord Jesus, and, and I'm going on with, uh, uh, you know, what about this? What about this? And, and you know, j just like any, if you've uh, talked to many people, if you try to give out the gospel, you're going to come across that arrogant uh, I was going to say atheist. You've come across that. I wasn't an atheist. I was never an atheist. I was never to the point that, that this just popped up. Um, but, but the God of the Bible wasn't God to me. And uh, so, so anyway, I'm, I'm talking with him. He's trying to tell me about Christ. And I'm trying to, to just poke holes in the Bible, poke holles in creation, poke holes in them. And uh, I'll never forget this. Here's where it all started for me. He, uh, he realizes at a certain point, I'm not going to listen to it. I'm not, I'm not listening to any verse that he's got. Don't remember a single verse from that night. Not a single one. Um, but I remember this. I remember him taking his glasses off and, and closing his Bible and laying his glasses down. And he looked at me and he said, Zach, if this isn't true, talking about the Bible, he says, we have no hope in this world. And uh, I didn't let on at the moment. But I went home and, and that, that thought, that, that statement kept kept running through my mind and uh, the more and more I thought about it uh, the more and more I realized he was right if I was right we have no hope in this world 
Um, there's only, if, if Christianity, if the Bible, if Bible Christianity isn't true, um, we don't have many options. Either there's no God at all, you live hard, you die. No hope. Or it's one of these other gods that wants me to earn my way into heaven, to work my way, and I already knew I couldn't do it. Folks, I can't live up to my own standards. I'm sure whatever the other, whatever God it was out there outside of this one that tells me I have to do something to be saved, I knew I wasn't going to live up to his. So uh, my options, when I come to that realization, uh, if this is ruled out, it's either live hard, die, you go in the ground, that's it, or I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to go to hell. And uh, so you know what I did? I started reading the Bible. I started reading the Bible. Um, Reluctantly, but I started reading it and uh, and I prayed and uh, I said God I didn't call him Lord. I didn't know him as Lord. That was a, a strange thing to say. I didn't call him father. He wasn't my father But I said God if, if, if this is true If this is true if, if this guy Jesus it was was your son who, who's also you and you, you know at that time You don't know anything. I said if it's true. I said I Just show me J just show me. Uh, maybe you're here tonight, and again, this is what I planned on talking about, but uh, maybe you're dealing with that. Maybe not to the extent I was, uh, but folks, he will answer that challenge. Uh, if you'll get into the Word of God with an open mind, uh, <laughs> you will not regret it. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I started reading, I started reading, I started learning. Eventually, I trusted Christ. I'm not going to get into all that because I only got five minutes left. Um, but uh, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that uh, his word says, seek and you shall find. Seek and you shall find. God, who spoke this world into existence, said, seek and you shall find. Now, here's the danger. There's two sides to that. If you're seeking a reason not to believe, he'll let you think you found one. If you're seeking to hang on to old false doctrine, whatever it may be. He'll let you think you found a reason. Folks, when you seek Him, though, you're going to find Him. Amen. When you seek Him, you're going to find Him. Look at Romans, Romans chapter 3 with me. Let's move on. I told Brother Rowan, we were eating before church, or they were eating, I was watching. Um, I get sleepy after I eat, and I'm already a little long-winded, and I told him that. And when I told him that, I could see him loosen his collar. Um, so I'm trying to keep it. I'm trying to keep it short. And I'm trying to stay on point. Uh, so for the sake of time, we're going to jump around. Uh, we're going to be quick. If you can't follow along, just 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 hang on. And if you miss a verse, it'll give you a reason to talk to me afterwards. So so just just listen up. Um, after all that, <laughs> I'm not. I love Brother Rowan. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not blaming him for this. Uh, after all that, for those of you that, that don't know me, uh, my name is Zach Knight. I'm from Ufala, Alabama. I'm Brother Steve's son-in-law. I married his daughter. Um, uh, four or five years ago. I'm kidding. I know what it is. I like to do it. That, that's only funny when she's here, but she's not here. But um, anyway, I, I pastor a small church in uh, uh, Batesburg, Leesville. Both of you are from South Carolina, right? Batesburg, Leesville. I'm sure you know where that is. No. Yeah, he's from there and done it. That's how small it is. It's, uh, we're about 30 minutes west of Columbia. Um, but I've been there about nine months. I'm originally from Eufaula um, with the uh, uh, Fellowship Baptist Church. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, you've all been asking, so let me just go ahead and, and, and say it. And I've already told some of you. Uh, I got two-year-old twin girls, um, and everybody's asking where they are. Well, I went through Grandmaville to get here, and, and they let me keep going, but there was no chance uh, the girls were going to make it. So anyway, maybe next time. Uh, hopefully next time. Hopefully next time. Anyway, um, for the sake of time, that's, that's all I can do for an introduction. Uh, we can talk later if you want to. But look with me in, uh, in Romans 3. Romans, well, Romans 4, really. Romans 4. I want you in Romans 4. Romans 4. I'm going to read to you a little bit out of Romans 3, and then I'll meet you in Romans 4. But uh, in Romans 3, Romans 3, uh, verses 9 through 18, we have the verdict on the human race. We have God's... Uh, 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 <laughs> God's opinion, not ours, not what we think, but what God thinks of every man that has ever walked this earth with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's nothing good about us. 
There's nothing good. It has nothing good to say about us. From, from Brother Rowan mentioned this morning, from the sole of my foot to the top of my head, there's nothing about me that is pleasing to God. And it's not just me, it's all of us. It's all of us. We come to verse 19. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. You see, what we need to go to heaven, what we need to spend eternity with a holy, righteous, perfect God is perfection. And we don't come close. On, on my best day, I don't come close. On, on the best second of the best minute of the best hour of the best day of the best month of the best year of my entire life, the Bible says I fall short. I fall short. You see, that's why the law was given in the first place. Not as this, this ladder that we use to climb into heaven. I, I, I say this all the time. I almost, you ever, as a preacher, you ever get tired of your own voice? Uh, I, I do this sometimes, but, but I say this all the time and I, I really get tired of hearing myself say it, but the law was never given as this tree where each commandment is a branch that we climb to get into heaven. The law was given as an ax to cut down our tree of self-righteousness and religion and everything that we think we're doing to please and, and, and gain favor with a holy God. It's the exact opposite. God gave it for the exact opposite reason of what most people use it today for. <clears throat> anyway, look at verse 21 though. But now the righteousness of God without the law, <laughs> thank God. Thank God, because I'd never do it. I'd never do it. Thank the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all... And upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. <clears throat> for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In verse 28, I know I told you to go to verse uh, chapter 4. Well, I'm going to get there. In verse 28, he says, Therefore we conclude, after everything we've looked at, we looked at the, the state of man, the very best that man can be, and we look at uh, how there is no hope for us in and of ourselves, and then we see that the righteousness of God, apart from the law, having nothing to do with the law, is unto us, and upon us, those that believe, I love verse 28, he says, therefore, we conclude. You see that word? We conclude. I, I love this verse. I love this word. We conclude. Paul's saying here, here's the end of the matter. This is the conclusion. This, this is the final say. Uh, you ever talk to people, you share certain verses that, 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 that absolutely say that Christ has done all the work, that he's taken care of sin, that it's not a future event, it's not something that needs to happen. And, and I mean, th there are verses in the Bible, verse after verse after verse that says this, and then they pull some obscure verse out of nowhere, and they say, well, what about this one? And you're standing on a mountain of verses, and they're over here, what about this one? This is why I love Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude, we conclude, here's the end of the matter, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. Amen. Look at chapter 4 with me. In chapter 4, this is where I wanted to go. Uh, and I'm looking at my time. <clears throat> I know I took a little longer. Uh, look with me. Paul here in chapter 4, after everything he says in chapter 3, he gives us some examples. He gives us Abraham. He gives us David. In verse 1 of Romans chapter 4, it says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Abraham, 430 years before the law was even given, believed Christ, believed God, but believed Christ, believed God concerning Christ. We're going to see that in a second. And he was counted righteous before the law was even given. 
And we'll go a little farther. We're not going to read it. But David, who lived under the law, did the same thing. It's always been by faith. It'll always be by faith. Back in Romans 3, it says that no flesh shall be justified in his sight. Romans 3, uh, Romans 3, 20, that's before the law, flesh, under the law, flesh. That's in the age of grace, which we live in. That's during uh, the tribulation, the millennium. No flesh at any time will ever be justified by the law. And here he gives us these examples. Now, turn back with me to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Y'all hang with me. I'm going to keep it short. I promise. Genesis chapter 15. <clears throat> this is exactly what Paul's quoting. In Romans 4, we're about to look at it. Take special note of what chapter we're in. I love talking about Abraham. Um, I plan on preaching something different. I'll tell you later why I changed it this afternoon. Um, but uh, I plan on preaching something different, uh, uh, but, but the Lord had other plans, so, so here we are. And uh, I love talking about Abraham. I talk about Abraham all the time, as often as I can. I talk about Abraham because you know what's unique about Abraham? We can actually pinpoint an exact verse or Abraham went from a lost man to a saved man. That, that is a, that, that's just a neat thing. There aren't many other people in the Bible you can do that, but we can, we can pin it down right here. Paul's quoting it in Romans chapter 4, Genesis chapter 15. This is God, uh, verse uh, 4, <clears throat> uh, verse 3. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Folks, right there. Right there, Abraham became a saved man. We can pinpoint it. We can literally mark it where Abraham went from lost to saved. Back up with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> I always feel like I'm racing the clock. And, and when you're already on the other side of it, I feel even... Uh, sorry, y'all bear with me. Bear with me, okay? Genesis chapter 12, this is where God first makes this promise to Abraham. To Abraham, it's not the first time he made the promise, it's the first time he made it to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, now the Lord, <clears throat> verse 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and uh, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Folks, this is an exciting verse right here. You know what this is? The promise God made in Genesis 3, right here in verse uh, chapter 12, he's telling Abraham, see, Abraham knew about that promise. He knew about the promises, uh, promise of Genesis 3.15. And right here he says, Abraham, I'm going to use you to do it. I'm going to come through you to accomplish this. He says, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I hear my pages sticking together. I, uh, I preached on Rome, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 a few weeks ago, and I got home. Um, <clears throat> I got home the next day. I opened up my Bible. I go to Hebrews 10, and I can't, uh, like, they're all stuck. And I'm like, was I foaming at the mouth or something? And, uh, anyway. <clears throat> So God promised the seed. He promised it in Genesis 3. In Genesis 12, he's telling Abraham, he says, through you, I'm going to make this happen. Three chapters later, Abraham believes it. Three chapters later, he believes it. God told him. It wasn't a prophet. It wasn't some janky leg preacher like me. God told him in chapter 12 and three chapters later, he believed it. But what did he believe? What, did he have a bunch of kids? That was part of it, but that's not, that's not what saved him. That's not what saved him. You know what he believed? He believed the same thing we believe today. Amen. With a little tweak. He believed it was coming. We believed it's happened. 
Folks, you know, a lot of people today don't really believe it's happened. They believe Christ has set it up and then we come in and finish it off. Folks, we don't finish anything. It's finished. It was finished 2,000 years ago. Folks, a lot of people, we love quoting that verse. John chapter 19 and verse 30. It's, a, it's with that verse that I saw the finished work of Christ. That's where I trusted Christ was in John chapter 19. And you hear people quoting it. You hear people talking about it. But not a lot of people really believe it. <clears throat> so what did Abraham believe? He believed that one day the seed of Genesis 3. You know why? We're not going to do it because I'm, I'm already out of time. But in Genesis 3, you know what I love about that? It's the first mention, verse 15, the first mention of Christ in the Bible. And you know what's interesting to me about it every time I read it? The first time the gospel was mentioned in the word of God, it wasn't a message of victory because of who it was being preached to. It was a message of defeat because he was telling the serpent, everything you just messed up, and we know who the serpent is. He says, everything that you think you've just done, I will, I will, God said, I will fix it. You see, it's a message of victory today, but when it was first spoken, he says, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. God said it in Genesis 3, tells Abraham in Genesis 12. In Genesis 15, Abraham believes it. He continues it. We can track it all the way through the Bible. We can track it all the way through the Bible, all through the prophets, all through the Psalms, through the, the kings, through David, through all the way. We can see it. Just He's on his way. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming over and over. The, the, everybody, everybody knows he's coming. Every book points to him. Every book points to him. We see it. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming finally one day. One day he got here. Abraham believed exactly what we believe, only that it was going to happen. We look back and say it has. In Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, I, I actually learned this from Brother Rowan years ago. You, you know where you find that? Not in Genesis. It's here in Galatians. In Galatians 3, Galatians 3, <clears throat> I, know I, I know you've been there for a minute. I'm finally there. Galatians 3, verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the Spirit of the Spirit, uh, promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Amen. Which is Christ. Jesus said in John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. Folks, he didn't just believe, he didn't just have faith in, in, in God's existence. He didn't just have faith in some generic promise. He believed a very specific promise. The promise of the seed of the woman in Genesis 3 would come through his line, would bruise Satan's head, would, would pay for our sins, not just our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Turn to 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> he believed this would happen, that God would keep his word. He was fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness. We today, it is that simple. Folks, it is so simple. Where's Brother Tuberville? Did he leave? He was here earlier. He mentioned in the morning hour uh, um, the simplicity of Christ. The simpli Folks, it's so simple. When we first hear it, it goes right over our heads. It, you know, that's what I said. When, I, when, I, when I'm talking to Mike, I'm talking to Brother John, I'm talking to these men, actually before we even talked, when I was coming to church and I was just sitting there with that look on my face, like I didn't want to be here, even at that point, I'm listening, I'm going, can't be that easy. That's what I said, can't be that easy. And that's why I'm tickled to death by 2 Corinthians 11.3, where he calls it the simplicity of Christ. Folks, it's so easy, we miss it. It's so easy that, that we add something to it without even realizing it. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Folks, here's what people miss today. They miss the finality of it. 
They miss the fact that it is an absolute <laughs> finished work. Folks, we don't contribute to it. We don't add anything to it. To try and do so is to actually take away from it. To say there's something left for me to do to finish it off is to say that Christ didn't do it all, that it wasn't finished, that he lied in John chapter 19. And we do it and we say that even though we don't say it out loud, we do that with good intentions, not meaning to. Folks, what people don't understand is that when he died, 2 Corinthians 5 with me, look with me. Brother Rowan read this this morning. <clears throat> he skipped over verse 17. I like that. I like that. I'm going to do it too. You want to know why? Because verse 17 doesn't matter unless you believe verses 18 through the rest of the chapter. They're just words. If you don't believe the rest of it. In verse 18 it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, hath reconciled, past tense, and given to us, <clears throat> and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Let me say this real quick. Brother Donnell signs his letters in the ministry of reconciliation. Folks, if you're here and you've trusted Christ as Savior, if you don't already know it, brother, I appreciate your call, your, your charge, or the challenge. Folks, if you don't already know it, you are a part of the ministry of reconciliation. Folks, he didn't save you to put you on the shelf. He didn't save you so you can wait around to go to heaven. Folks, we have a work to do here. And what is the work? <clears throat> Verse uh, 19, he tells us what the work, uh, the ministry of reconciliation is. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself this next These next five words are my favorite words in the Bible. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Folks, people read that and they say, you see this? When you believe it or when you, when you change your life or when something about you improves, they say at some point, he won't impute your trespasses unto you. Folks, that's not what the Word of God says. It says to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their, who is there in that verse? The world, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You know how he can say that? Why he can say that? Is because they were imputed to Christ. Folks, he didn't just die this token death where, where once we believe in the death, then we receive the forgiveness. Folks, when he died, he not only died for our sins, he died with our sins. Folks, you don't have a sin debt. You've never had a sin debt. Your problem, if you're here and you don't know where you're going when you die, your problem is you haven't believed it. Or either you think you did something to make it happen in your lifetime. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Brother, uh, Brother Rowan mentioned the verse this morning, John 3, 18, tells you exactly why people go to hell and it says nothing about sin. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he didn't pray a prayer? Because he didn't get baptized? Because he didn't go through this ritual that, that the churches are telling him to go? No, it says because he hath not believed. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Folks, that's what separates us. That's what you got lost sinners and saved sinners. That's all this world's made up of. And that's the only thing separating the two. That's what separates people from heaven and hell. Will we take God at his word? Or will we go about it ourselves? That's right. Right. You say, it's, it's not that simple. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah, sir. <clears throat> yeah, good Verse 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us. But I ask this question all the time. The sin, Jesus who had no sin, for him to be made sin, for God to lay on him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, for him to do that, where did it come from? If I keep mine, if I'm hanging on to mine, 
and he's made sin who has no sin, then God had to make up some sin so that we can keep ours and yet he can say that he made him to be sin. Folks, where did it come from? It wasn't his and it didn't just come out of thin air. It was mine. It was yours. Folks, he died with your sins. And see, the world needs to know that. People don't know it. He made him to be sin for us. Jesus Christ willingly took upon himself my sin, your sin, the sin of the world. And we say took upon him. Folks, he took it upon his record. He became guilty for the, the guiltless, for the guilty. Amen. The just for the unjust. Folks, he became sin for us. In 1 Peter 2.23, uh, he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You know what God did? He judged him righteously. People say, it's not fair what happened to Jesus. It was fair. Because in that day, in that day, on his account, on his record, God saw him not as the sinless son of God, but as the sin bearer, the one responsible for sin, for all sin, and he dealt with him accordingly. Until the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, he was 100% satisfied. Folks, if God is satisfied, why are we still trying to do something? What I really wanted us to see tonight, we started in Romans 4, and I know I'm out of time. Forgive me. I, I hope you'll invite me back. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 20. Brother, and this is what, I, this is, to be honest, this is all I wanted to talk about tonight, 2 Corinthians 5. And I've had this plan for three years. And you know why I changed my, my sermon just a little bit? We ended up here, but we didn't start there. You want to know why? It's because we just did that this morning. I didn't want everybody thinking I was following, following you like I'm a copycat. But I, I spent all afternoon trying to find something else to preach on, and I just couldn't do it. Here we are. Three years ago, I preached on this passage of Scripture. And on my way back to Alabama, I, I, my emphasis was on verse 19 as it ought to always be. But on my way back to Alabama, verse 20 jumped out at me like it never has before. <clears throat> now then we are ambassadors, this is Paul speaking, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. What is he saying? He's saying believe it. Believe that reconciliation has taken place. Believe it. Be ye reconciled. Believe that reconciliation has already happened. But what gets me, what jumped out at me like never before, as ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, as if Christ were here right now, as if he were behind this pulpit, or as if he were the one writing this letter that Paul is pinning down right here, because he really is the writer, as if it was him personally, he says, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Folks, my question is why? Preachers, missionaries, evangelists, pastors, whatever you are. Folks, why are we telling people today to say a prayer, to be saved, to be reconciled, so that their sins won't be imputed to them. Why are we leading them through this prayer when right here in verse 20, Paul in Christ's stead, as if Christ is the one speaking, is praying to us to believe it. On his behalf. Why? Why are we doing that? Why don't we just believe it? You know what we're doing? We, we, get, we get overzealous. Brother, Brother Steve preached last night about I, I've been guilty of it. I, I've wanted to see souls saved so badly. I've tried to literally preach faith into their minds. And folks, we can't do it. Not only, not only is, it, is it dangerous, but we're intruding into the office of the Holy Spirit when we do that. You know, sometimes we use the expression, doing the work of the Holy Spirit. That, that doesn't sound so bad. We are intruding into His office. 
let me close with this. Turn back to Genesis with me. Turn back to Genesis. Chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. You can put a flag there. You can draw the stake down. Here's where Abraham became a saved man. Look at chapter 12 with me. When did Brother Steve stop preaching last night? If I can just finish before him, I know I'm, I know I'm good. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12, look at verse 8. This is Abraham. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 13 is the most misused verse in all of Scripture. Why didn't Abraham get saved right here? If Romans 10, 13 is a salvation of the sole verse, why didn't Abraham get saved? Look at verse chapter 13. Verse 4. <clears throat> Genesis 13, 4. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Why didn't Abraham get saved right here? He did it twice and didn't get saved. He believed God and he was counted a righteous man for all eternity. Folks, that, that sinner's prayer at 15 years old, that this, this antagonistic attitude I had, it, I didn't start there. I started out as a kid in church. I started out as a kid at 15 years old. I went down front, I prayed the prayer with everything I had in me. Every, I wish I prayed today the way I prayed that day. And a preacher told me I was saved. A man with a Bible and a tie. He had a regular tie, not a cool tie. <laughs> he told me I was saved. And for 11 years of my life, I thought I was fine. You know what I found out, Brother Rowan? I was also one of those Matthew 7 guys. Lord, Lord. Folks, here's my question. This is what I want to leave you with. Everybody here. I want to leave you with this. Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. According to that verse, if a man believes the gospel without praying a prayer, is he saved? Yes, he is. Now, if a man prays the prayer, but doesn't really believe the gospel, is he saved? No. Then why use it at all? Why, why do we use it at all? You, you know what happened to me at 15? <clears throat> I got a vaccine. I got a truth vaccine. Where for the next 11 years, when somebody came to me with the truth, I had this immunity built up. I'm good. I don't need it. I don't need it, Brother Joe. I don't need what you got. I pray, I'm good. I'm good. I'm safe. I'm taken care of. Folks, why don't we just preach Christ? Why don't we just preach the finished work? Why don't we just preach? It's done, Brother Stone. Why don't we preach that and then just stop? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, brother. Hey.